Yes, let's start with a sneak peek at the new supercomputer. This session will be given by two prominent speakers. Let me introduce the first one. He is manager research services at SURF, and he's responsible for four research services teams, including the supercomputing team. Please welcome Walter Leon. Welcome, welcome, Walter. Thank you, Emily. Great to have you here. <laughs> Great to be in a real-life uh, venue. Exactly. And, uh, meeting people face to face. Yeah, that does feel better, doesn't it? Yeah. Than everything online continuously. Some breath, some real life. So again, great to have you here. I believe you can tell us more about the new supercomputer uh, and what benefits it all has. Yeah, I'll give it a try. Yeah, you'll give it a try. Great. And um, for you at home. Uh, please ask your questions in the chat for Walter, because we'll have a little bit of time uh, afterwards. The virtual okay. stage Thank is you. yours. Thank you, Emily. So, welcome everyone at the sneak peek at the new national supercomputer. Um, then, uh, of course, I should start with the, the replacement of the current system. And the question is, why do we want to replace uh, such a nice system? And the reality is that the current system, Cartesius, that the oldest part uh, earlier this month uh, had its eighth birthday. So in eight years is uh, really old for a supercomputer, like for your laptop or your mobile phone. Uh, a couple of years is already old, but for a supercomputer, five to six years, uh, it uh, becomes uh, almost uh, obsolete. And now we are running in overtime for already two years. Uh, the replacement itself, uh, we started with the first memos uh, writing in 2017, and we attempted to start the first tender in uh, 2018, but we still had to secure our budget, so we had to put our tender on hold. Finally, the budget for was uh, arranged by the end of 2019, so overall we have a 20 million budget for five years, and the nice thing here is that also the funding for the replacement of the new system is already secured for, uh, the, for 2026 and on. So last year we started our uh, new tender uh, and we were targeting production halfway this year. So what do we envision in a new supercomputer? First of all, uh, as uh, many people know, we are using both CPUs and GPUs to do the computing, but uh, we should find a right balance between the general purpose character of our system, because we are the only national system. We have to support all science fields, uh, and not everyone can uh, make good use of uh, GPUs or accelerated computing in general. Furthermore, what's important to us is the corporate social responsibility, so everyone uh, can imagine that uh, we want to be green, but it's far more than just being green. It's uh, really the social responsibility. You don't want to have children working on uh, components or uh, not recycling material of older systems. There are a couple of other things that are important to us. I only mentioned the names. It's unified computing. We want also want to do uh, containerized uh, workflows and allow for federation. Furthermore, we have a lot of money, 20 million, and, but we also want to, want to spend this wisely. So what we are targeting is a phased or on-demand uh, strategy where we can optimally exploit roadmaps of the different vendors. So we allocate uh, some so 80 to 85 percent for a phase one and a phase two and we create options for the last phase, phase three, for 15 to 20 percent of the overall budget, and we will decide later well, whether we will spend it on GPUs or additional uh, compute nodes. 
but in the end, what we want to, do, to, to, to reach is just best value for money. To reach that, we had a close look at what researchers are doing on the current system and also trying to predict what they will do on the upcoming systems. So we had to look at the applications that are typically used by the user. Then we are, you look at the actual use of the applications spread across scientific fields, uh, scaling of uh, those uh, applications. And we also try to target uh, upcoming fields. So uh, we also want to do big data and machine learning that should also be uh, supported in our benchmark suite that we try to define. Uh, finally, we, de we selected eight of the application codes that are being used by our researchers. And they overall are uh, responsible for 40 5% of the total workload on the Cartesian system during its uh, past lifetime. And also, uh, good to note, we included GPU benchmarks. Uh, the final application benchmark suite uh, that we selected was uh, selected in uh, close uh, communication with uh, our funding agency, NWO. What do we use this application benchmark suite for? Uh, measurements of uh, the, the speed, uh, prediction of uh, uh, speed on uh, not yet available hardware, and commitments of the vendors, uh, what they uh, promise us to deliver in the future. So what we measure is time to solution and energy to solution, so we can measure speed and energy efficiency. And what we try to derive is the throughput of the total system. So a combination of speed and size delivers you the amount of science you can do on such a system. The tender uh, took place uh, last year. Uh, we used uh, what's called a competitive dialogue procedure. Uh, we started with a pre-qualification uh, and uh, early last year, four tenderers uh, qualified and entered the dialogue phase. Um, we, we, we choose this because during the dialogue we still can have discussion with the tenderers about the solution that they uh, are going to build for us and we can fine tune the solution that they want to deliver. Finally, we ended up with uh, receiving two proposals uh, in September. Both proposals uh, uh, were qualified. Uh, they had many similarities. Architecture, chip choice were all very similar and Lenovo clearly made the best proposal, rating higher on six of the seven uh, parts of our uh, assessment criteria, which we define upfront in our tender documentation. Most importantly are the application performance, which we weighted for 40%. There they were the clear winner because they offered much larger number of nodes in phase two and phase three, and also for corporate social responsibility, which we awarded with 15% of our points uh, there they were also had made the, the largest difference in scoring best on three out of four sub-questions. And finally, the contract was awarded early this year on uh, February 1. So a quick overview. I'm not going to read out this slide. Uh, you can uh, read it for your own. Uh, basically, in phase one, we will have CPU nodes and GPU nodes. For the CPU nodes, we will use the, one of the latest AMD generations, uh, AMD Rome, with 128 cores per node. Apart from that, uh, like we have in Cartesius, we have thin nodes and fat nodes, fat nodes having more memory. What's new in Snellius is that we also will have local storage uh, using NVMEs. And what's also new in uh, Snellius is that we will have two high memory nodes, one or two with four terabytes and two even with uh, eight terabytes. Phase one GPU will use the, the latest uh, NVIDIA GPUs, uh, similar, and I will come to the comparison between Cartesius and Snellius in uh, one of my uh, next slides. Phase two and three. Uh, phase two is envisioned for uh, mid uh, next year. Phase two will be uh, completely CPU based. Uh, it will be the next generation AMD, which is still under NDA. For phase three, as I said in the uh, beginning, we will have uh, three options, CPUs, GPUs, or still to determine uh, amount of uh, storage. Uh, and uh, the final peak performance of Snellius mid-2023 will reach 
something between 13 and uh, 21 uh, petaflop. So how does this compare uh, Snellius with uh, Cartesius? On the left side, uh, I give uh, some uh, specifications of uh, Cartesius. A lot of numbers I'm not going to read, same for Snellius. But if you look at the comparison for phase one, which will become operational this year, the number of CPUs will already incre increase by a factor one and a half. The number of GPUs uh, remains similar, but by using a much more recent uh, or the latest greatest NVIDIA GPU, the performance of the GPUs will be 14 times the performance of the GPUs in Cartesius, and we will reach total peak performance, which is three and a half times uh, Cartesius at this very moment. Phase two will become operational next year, and phase one and two combined will end up with a total peak performance, uh, which is uh, six times uh, the current system and the full system uh, mid-2023 uh, will uh, reach somewhere between eight and 12 times the peak performance we have for the current system, depending on whether we will use uh, CPUs or GPUs. The timeline for uh, Snellius, um, we, we started uh, the production uh, of the system or <laughs> uh, Lenovo started the production of the system uh, back in, uh, in March and also the preparation of the, the site uh, started. Uh, there are a lot of steps uh, which will follow the coming uh, months. Uh, next week, actually, the, del the, the, delivery be, sorry, the delivery of the hardware will, will start. Uh, we envision to do the acceptance test uh, in July. Uh, then we still need the month August for doing the configuration and the data migration of the users. So overall, we, we now are lagging behind uh, two months uh, with respect to the original planning. Uh, and we envision start of production uh, by the end of August, uh, so say September 1. So summarizing, for Snellius, uh, we try to have best value for money. It will still be uh, largely general purpose. Uh, there will be a significant, significant growth in uh, GPU capacity. Uh, it will be even more heterogeneous than uh, Cartesius, where we already took a heterogeneous approach. Uh, the performance growth will be an order of magnitude. Uh, what we try to do is optimize the usability for the scientists, so we don't uh, design this system for being a top 500 killer. It would be easy to rank very high on the international top 500 but then it wouldn't be as usable as what we try to establish here. And finally, it will soon be ready for exciting new scientific discoveries. So I'm looking forward to Detlef Lohse's uh, talk, our next speaker, where he might give some flavor of what's going on on Cartesius and what will be possible uh, using Snellius. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walter. That went smooth. Yeah. <laughs> I heard a lot of CPUs, GPUs. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but as long as you know what it means. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I was able to, to get some people or keep some people on board also. But, uh, I'm yeah, sure, it, but it we have... It should be a bit technical. Yes, it's Otherwise, very... Otherwise, if we promise a sneak peek, it should be a, should, a sneak yes, peek. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But we have lots of questions. Ah, very good. Uh, we have about five. We have much more, but the moderator backstage uh, chose, uh, chose a few. The first one is, by using those eight codes, don't you have the potential risk of developing a tunnel vision? You might be catering for the lucky few who already use the Cartesius. How do you make sure that the system is generally applicable and available for all? Now, the, the last part, the available for all uh, part, uh, that's simple. Uh, you just apply for access. But the question is a real good question, but it's asking for the unknown unknowns, yeah. which is virtually impossible to answer. Okay. So uh, when we look at the applications we currently selected, uh, it's not only based on what we have seen on uh, the current system 
for the, the last eight years already, right. but it also reflects the use of the national supercomputing starting from uh, the mid-80s, uh, from the previous century where we always have seen a couple of science fields that typically use HPC. Right. So we try to, to, to target also uh, new upcoming fields like machine learning, but uh, there will always be uh, applications lacking from uh, this, uh, this uh, exercise we did. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope your answer is kind of answered here by. And otherwise, uh, Rob van Nieuwpoort uh, knows where to find me, so we can have a nice discussion about well, it. Well, that's nice, Rob, so you know. Moving on to the second question, how will Snellius compare to other supercomputers in Europe or the world? Yeah, let's start with the world. So the, the largest supercomputer in the world currently is in Japan. It's the Fugaku. It has uh, 537 uh, petaflop uh, peak performance. Wow. And, uh, that's, uh, and uh, we are talking here about at most 20 petaflop, so it's 20 fold, uh, wow, uh, more, 20, 20 times more powerful than uh, our current system. But then the Fugaku system also uh, took some 800 million euros to, to also including the development because they developed their own hardware. Right. Uh, and we o only have 20 million. <laughs> only? <laughs> yeah. But, and the upcoming um, largest uh, systems in uh, Europe now are, are several hundred uh, petaflops. Wow. So wow. We, 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 we are not comparable to the largest systems in the world. But, we are but do we have to be so comparable? You don't, you don't have to be, no. because in the end we will collaborate uh, in exactly. Europe and uh, we are collaborating in Praise and Euro HPC and uh, there is the possibility also for Dutch research, uh, right. researchers to use those European facilities. Okay, thank you. Moving on to our third question, Walter, how sustainable is a supercomputer? Yeah, sustainable in what sense is then the question. Yeah. But, uh, if we look at uh, the, the energy efficiency, as I mentioned, uh, looking at uh, the, the energy efficiency uh, from one generation to the next generation, so we are talking about orders of magnitude and increase of computing power, but it's always sticking at the same order of magnitude of energy consumption. Right. So in that sense, uh, although we uh, will grow in absolute sense from one megawatt, which sounds humongous, of course, to 1.5 megawatt, yes. it's still in the same order of magnitude and it will be tenfold more uh, energy efficient. And if it's about sustainability, about uh, reusing hardware, because the question we always get, what do you do with your sure. supercomputer? Uh, yeah, what do you do with your old phone that's uh, five years old? What do you do with your old laptop? Exactly. There are recycling programs, so every component that can be reused will be reused, and all materials that are inside will also be uh, re got, uh, taken out of it and will also be reused. But really, reusing an old supercomputer you shouldn't do because of the gains in energy efficiency it's more cost effective to buy a new supercomputer in a couple of years because then uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, the difference will be millions of euros per uh, for right. the lifetime of the system only for energy consumption. Yeah, okay, good to know, good to know. To what extent is the production of Snellius delayed by the global chip shortage? Ah, good question, easy answer. It's not delayed because <laughs> of the global chip shortage. Okay. This is uh, completely arranged for with uh, the, the chip uh, uh, vendor that uh, delivers uh, what we are using in this system. Okay, great. Great. I think we have one more question. Uh, fascinating, Walter. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> have we got one more question or not? I mean, we have many, many questions. No more highlighted questions then. I'd like to thank you very much and move okay. on to the thank next speaker. Much. Thank you. Thank you Pleasure. for your presentation. And um, I'll see you at the end, at the okay. wrap-up. Yeah. So our next speaker is a German physicist living in the Netherlands and affiliated with the University of Twente, amongst many other titles and responsibilities. Please welcome Detlef Loser. Hello, Detlef. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Enschede. From well, Twente. Great, great. And how are you feeling? 
I'm fine. Looking forward to uh, to the sessions and uh, to the talks and to the discussions. It sounds like you're in an enormous uh, event hall. <laughs> I, I'm I'm just at home, so. <laughs> wow. <laughs> No, it's good, it's good, but I was just checking uh, with the technic technical team here. Um, well, actually, uh, the, the, the virtual stage is yours. Um, well, thanks a lot. Can you please share my presentation? Yes. Okay. So my talk today is on fluid dynamics and high-performance computing, and I hope to be able to give you some examples and also uh, answers to the questions which were put forward to water. So, um, first of all, on the relevance of fluid dynamics, um, I put it in four areas, fluid dynamics for climate research, fluid dynamics for the energy transition, fluid dynamics for health, and fluid dynamics for high tech. And uh, speaking of uh, climate, examples like cloud formation and global warming, Gulf Stream reversal, melting of ice, uh, wherever there was spreading of air pollution uh, and on fluid dynamics of energy transition, electrolysis and H2 technology, catalysis and batteries, uh, LNGs, wind and thermal solar energy, uh, and on health, aerosols and COVID-19, medical diagnostics and lab on a ship, organ on a ship and ultrasound imaging, uh, and fluid dynamics for high tech, inkjet printing, additive manufacturing, uh, XEOV and water cleaning. And in all these fields, high performance computing has a major role uh, and really pushed the field ahead. I think we now live in the golden age of fluid dynamics, and this is thanks uh, to uh, high performance computing because now things which can be measured and things which can be computed are uh, really uh, coming together and uh, this gap has been bridged. So I will be able to only show you two examples. I will very briefly uh, show you um, the uh, Gulf Stream reversal uh, and this context. So in this context, I show you, uh, in fact, uh, this numerical simulation. It's a model system, a fluid heated from below and cooled from above. And you see how some flow is developing. So we, this is the example for, uh, say, a Gauss stream reversal, uh, and it's done on Cartesius. We have a CPU version of this code and a, a GPU version of this code, um, which was able, thanks to the support of Sir Sarah and Walter and his team, uh, and also this visualization. We had great help uh, from Sir Sarah. Um, and the other example I would like to show you uh, in this context uh, is uh, um, uh, unknown, unknown two years ago, and this is aerosols and COVID. And uh, with this unknown, unknown, which uh, unfortunately became very uh, much known recently, uh, we could do uh, high performance computing uh, thanks to Sir Sarah and support. So I will show you uh, this example and come to extended lifetime of respiratory droplets and its implication on airborne disease transmission. And this is joint work with uh, several uh, PhD students and postdocs and my colleague Roberto Vesico, whom you see all here. So um, here I show you a numerical simulation uh, of a respiratory event. And you will have to get used to this. I will play it uh, several times. Um, so uh, from, from the left, uh, someone speaking or coughing. Uh, and what you see in color are all these droplets and the um, droplets themselves are in fact uh, colored according to the size. The red ones uh, are the big ones and the green ones are the small ones. What is also colored, this is the background color, uh, is the relative humidity. So you uh, speak or breathe into the environment and your, your breath has very high humidity and uh, this humidity is given by some color. So here you have ambient humidity of 90%, but the relative humidity is in fact much higher. Um, and what you see at the bottom are the droplets falling to the ground. These are the heavy ones. They uh, don't stay in the air, but the small ones, the green ones, they do stay into the air, and this is the problem. So 
uh, you also want to see a real respiratory event. And this is this visualization from Lydia Borivia and uh, her team. Um, and in fact, that aerosols are around and uh, are a danger for infections has been known more than 100 years. So Soper in his famous paper wrote, there's danger in the air. And what I would like to address is where is this danger? How long is this danger and under what condition? And this is possible thanks to high performance computing. Uh, so the method is diagnomical simulation. Uh, so we inject uh, these droplets together with a human puff, which emerges when speaking and would like to see what's the effect of this turbulent vapor puff uh, and what is the effect of the relative humidity and the temperature and the effect of the ventilation. Uh, so here you see uh, the um, local relative humidity coming out from speaking after uh, 10, uh, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, and 400 milliseconds. And what you see is that the local relative humidity is much, much larger than the background relative humidity. And this has implications. And the implication is that these droplets live much, much longer as compared to isolated droplets. Uh, so uh, the reason is that these droplets are trapped, the small ones. So here I follow uh, small droplets in blue uh, uh, and uh, medium-sized droplets in green and large droplets in red. So the large guys fall to the ground, uh, whereas the small ones, uh, they stay in the air. They are trapped in turbulent vortices, and therefore their lifetime is very much extended. Uh, so here you see uh, details of these curves of these droplets. They are protected by the humid puff. Um, so how do these absolute uh, evaporation times of these droplets compare to Wells' classical evaporation falling curve? This is a prediction from 1936, believe it or not. Uh, this current six feet distance rule uh, or two meter distance rule in times of uh, COVID is based on this uh, a prediction from Wells from 1936. And the question is, how well does this prediction hold? So here's this classical Wells curve. What you see uh, on the left axis is a droplet diameter with the large guys uh, on, uh, on at the top, and to the right is time. So these are trajectories. Uh, droplets are falling down, so to say. And here they touch the ground um, at the top. Whereas on the bottom, they evaporate. They are small and they evaporate. And these curves follow uh, from this very simple theory from 1936, which, however, um, assumes uh, the, um, this, um, that the one droplet is individual. So what you see is that below this red curve, according to the theory, there should be no droplets. Therefore, uh, the two feet rule. Now, let's see reality from our numerical simulations. And what you see is that a huge amount of droplets uh, live uh, if, um, in that region where they are supposed not to be around. So this Wells theory doesn't hold at all. And correspondingly, this two meter row is, uh, rule is not enough at all. So the majority, in fact, exceeds Wells lifetime. And in fact, they exceed um, Wells' lifetime, not only a little bit, uh, but uh, tremendously. And this implies that they also travel much, much longer uh, than these two meters. So when you now um, look uh, into numbers, so six feet rules is not sufficient, and we now look into numbers, we see here for uh, ME and relative humidity of 50% that the lifetime is up to 40 times larger as compared to Wells' prediction. And when we go to relative uh, ambient humidity of 90%. Uh, in fact, the lifetime is up to 150 times longer. And correspondingly, they travel much longer. In fact, here you see the lifetime of the droplets as function uh, of the ambient relative humidity. And you see it's diverging. And the lifetime is much, much uh, longer, so up to 200 times here. So uh, why is this the case? Uh, well. Um, the case is that uh, the high relative humidity uh, protects the puff, uh, and this puff protects the droplet. And therefore, uh, the uh, evaporation is delayed. Um, 
So here I visualize this path, this protecting path, uh, and therefore this wealth estimate is no longer justified. Um, so uh, we want to do a parameter study. So how does it depend on temperature? How does it depend on relative humidity? And this is only possible thanks to high performance uh, computing. I mean, these are extremely costly numerical simulations which we could do on Cartesius. Uh, and um, we, we have to do more, as you will see, uh, but already this gives some idea and helps us to reveal uh, the physics. For example, what is the role of the ambient temperature? Uh, so here I show you a simulation at a relative uh, humidity of 90% at the ambient temperature of 30 degrees. We did this last summer. And you see that this humid path is relatively quickly um, evaporating uh, and, and um, uh, in fact, um, uh, dissolving. And the droplets are uh, therefore uh, vanishing relatively quickly. I mean, of course, not by far not as quickly as well suggests, but uh, quicker as compared to the case of 10 degrees, which I show you here. So at 10 degrees, in fact, uh, the air uh, around you is, very, uh, is, uh, is much, much colder than what you breathe out. Uh, but the, what can be taken up of vapor in the surrounding is much, much higher for high temperatures. So um, the uh, saturation concentration at low temperatures is pretty, uh, pretty low. So what about all this humidity which comes out of your mouth? Well, uh, it leads to local oversaturation and therefore to the growth of these droplets. And uh, let's put this in numbers. So let's compare those two cases here. Um, so the, the huge effect of this uh, size uh, of the relative humidity. So uh, we see here the shrinkage of the droplets as function of time for 30 degrees. Uh, diameter squared versus time, it goes down. Whereas uh, for the 10 degree case, in fact, uh, they, they even grow in the beginning. And why do they grow? Uh, well, um, the growth is uh, because of the local uh, oversaturation caused by the cold temperatures. So the relevant parameter is the local relative humidity uh, at the droplet. Um, and uh, for 30 degrees, this is below one, so it's undersaturated, so the droplets can, in fact, evaporate. Detlev, uh, excuse me. I'm very, very sorry that I have to interrupt, but um, you have two more minutes, because we also have a few questions from the viewers. Yes, I, yes. Uh, if, we, if you, I'm you sorry. take my slides, then I can, then can I finish my talk. Perfect. So the local oversaturation here makes these droplets survive. Uh, and um, we all know this, in fact, from, from winter time. Uh, so as we see here, um, with the warm air can contain more moisture than cold air and you get nucleation of growth. So in conclusion of this part, uh, we, we see that there's a paradig paradigmatical change from this isolated droplet emission picture by wells. Uh, towards a multi-phase turbulent cloud emission picture. Clearly, this uh, two feet rule, this, this two meters rule, six feet rule is outlawed, out, outruled. And um, the conclusion is that we can really answer where and how uh, is there danger and how long. Um, and we have worked out the physics principle. So what most serious is a small ambient temperature and uh, in fact, large relative humidity. And that is published here on the cover of PRL. Uh, and uh, oh, there are open questions, various open questions, which you can see here. Um, and um, many of these questions, in fact, uh, can be answered by high performance computing. And we are looking forward to contribute uh, to that. I mean, one of these questions I had in the second part, but I realized that there is no time for that. And that second part uh, would have been on ventilation. So how did we use um, numerical simulations to develop uh, ventilation concepts? Thank you. Thank you very much, Detlev. And very sorry to interrupt you, but we just had 15 minutes. And um, I'd very much like to ask you two questions of our participants, if that's OK. And the first sure. one is, did you compare 
with measurements of real-life experiment, and can you simulate mouth masks and their effectiveness? So right now we compare one-to-one -to, -one to real life experiments uh, to uh, study the lifetime of these droplets and where they go. So these experiments are ongoing. Um, and uh, on uh, simulations with uh, face masks, um, so we ourselves haven't uh, done so, but others did, and this can indeed also be numerically simulated. Right. And are your conclusions taken into account by OMT? Um, well, some, some of them uh, are uh, taken into account, while others not. I mean, my, uh, my very strong uh, suggestion was uh, a face mask. Uh, we, we see these high infections, clearly FFP face mask and very strong ventilation, but uh, the situation, unfortunately, is suboptimal. And um, I think we must try to not only bridge the gap between theory and experiment, but we clearly must also bridge the gap between engineering and science. Uh, and uh, medicine. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for your time and energy. And um, I'm sure you can do the rest of your presentation uh, very soon in the future. But thanks again. And also, Walter, thank you too, both, for this session.